Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Teacher Cast Podcast, coming to you live from the birthplace of Rocky Balboa in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of the Teacher Cast Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and if you're listening for the first time, we welcome you and hope that you join us each and every week as we bring you outstanding educational professional development. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and you are listening to the podcast for educators of all grade levels and subject areas. We are here to help bring your students to the next level, one podcast at a time. And you'll have to forgive me today, everybody out there listening. I'm a bit under the weather. This is the traditional, our seasons are changing here in Philadelphia, and as the winter starts to come upon us, I get this little uh, this little cold that comes upon me. So if we uh, have any vocal problems today... Uh, Thank you for your, your your thoughts there. Today we have a great show. We are talking all about Twitter, social media, hashtags, and we have two professional tweeters out there. I want to introduce our great friend from the Sat Chat hashtag, Mr. Brad Curry. Brad, how are you today? Outstanding, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here on TeacherCast podcast yet again, and it's a great uh, resource for educators around the world. Well, thank you for joining us. How was uh, how's everything in Sat Chat world? Outstanding. We had another unbelievable chat yesterday on cohesive faculties and how important it is for a faculty to be together, not only for themselves but for the kids, for the school, for the district. It's just uh, good all around. Uh, we had over 150 people in the chat, uh, both East Coast and West Coast, and it really was a great uh, day yet again with the Sat Chat crew. That is nice. And you guys do that Saturday mornings at 7.30, right? 7.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And then we have the West Coast crew at 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, with Shelly Burgess, uh, David Kolberhouse, uh, Amy, uh, Director Amy, and also um, uh, Dr. Jolly and uh, a few others. So it's really good out in the West Coast there. Nice. Well, thank you for joining us once again on our podcast. Thank you. And I also want to bring together the heavyweight champion of teacher uh, of Twitter, our good friend, Cyberary Man himself, Jerry Blumengarten. Jerry, how you doing down there in Florida, man? I'm getting over a little virus from you northerners, but other than that, I'm doing great. Aside from uh, trying to cope with uh, the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, and I, my heart and prayers and uh, are with all the people that have been affected by it and some of my PLN members as well in in the Newtown schools. In fact, the uh, principal of the Newtown High School is one of my followers, and I did tweet with him. It's a very sad thing, and, and you know, we've, I'm very concerned about the children and staff members and the community. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I did want to hit a, on a little bit about that. Um, we are recording this podcast on Sunday the 16th, and we're going to be posting it next Sunday, so it might be a little bit outdated with some of the information. But, uh, Brad, could you kind of sum up what we know right now and maybe some of the things that uh, you're hearing um, going around social media and, and regular news features? Yeah, it's just an absolutely um, horrible time here, not only in our world, but in the educational world. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad. You know, you had Columbine a number of years ago, and now you see this. Um, and with, with any type of uh, child, whether it's a, a kindergartner or, or a senior in high school, uh, you never want to see anybody uh, get hurt or have their life in danger. And, and we uh, unfortunately saw 20 um, first graders, kindergartners, uh, six and seven year olds uh, have their lives taken from them. Uh, it hits home with me because I have a, a, a six year old son and, uh, you know, it's put tears in my eyes. Uh, over the last three or four days, and it's uh, it's very sad. And um, you know, we just come together, um, our PLN educators from around the world. We just come together and do what we can to help these people out, learn from it. It's going to change the way I think the way schools are protected moving forward. I don't think we have any other options um, because we have so many kids in our schools and 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 adults, and we're going to. Uh, really look at, re-examine how we protect our schools. Uh, they're very safe, but they can be safer. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But, you know, just like everybody else, we're thinking about those people up in Connecticut, and, and we hope uh, that they can get through this. Now, Brad, I, just, I just want to mention something which I think America should know. 
Teachers in the classroom really care about their students. And here are some people who put their lives right on the line and who died as a result of trying to protect their students, their children. And, and I, I, you know, my heart really goes out to them. And America has to understand, the world has to understand that teachers really care about their students and will try to do anything they can to protect them. Brad, could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the emails that you've had back and forth over the last couple of days with your own school district of maybe how things might be changing immediately for your district and maybe those around you? Yeah, I mean, we, we've had uh, various uh, communications back and forth with our crisis management team, um, our, our school psychologists um, in particular, um, really had, have some, some great um, ideas in terms of you know how to, to help parents, you know, be able to speak with their children about these events, even though it didn't directly happen to them. Children do have a sense of what uh, has gone on, and we need to talk to them in the appropriate way. So we're going to uh, continue to do that moving into this week, and we're going to meet as an administrative team early this week and just re-examine our school safety plans with what happened in Connecticut in Sandy Hook in mind. And... Um, you know, I haven't thought of any other um, in, important things related to this, but one thing that we, we can possibly do moving forward is leverage the power of, of social media and technology during a time of crisis. There are some tools out there that are appearing um, that people can use on their mobile devices in the classroom, in the event, you know, for example, if they're in a, in a lockdown or something where they're able to communicate with the outside uh, world or the, or the police department, what have you, that are outside of the building uh, to let them know that we're okay and to, to, you know, for accountability measures. So um, it is something that I shared with my superintendent. Uh, I think right now it's in, it's in beta, but there is a product out there that uh, you'll be able to do this um, in the near future, and, and we're looking to possibly uh, implement that uh, moving forward because people do have – their mobile devices, their phones with them, their iPads, their laptops. It's just reality. You can't change it, so let's just use it to the best of our ability. Now, Jerry, you've been an educator for a long time. And, Brad, you've been an educator for a long time, and you're an administrator. There's violence that happens in the schools on a consistent basis. And, and I'm not trying to make light of any of this, but with keeping Columbine in mind and, uh, and a few of these other examples, why is this one so different? Why does this one sting the country a little bit more than everything else? Well, Whoa, that's a, that's a very tough one. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, just totally, it's totally innocent children were, were in, in school, in a classroom, in an environment, and someone just broke in and, and carried out this dastardly act. I mean, it's just, there's no rhyme or reason, no sense to it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think a lot of lives were saved um, by, as Jerry said, these heroic teachers that, that, that tried to, to save these kids. Uh, I mean, I think the gunman was looking to possibly, it looks like, uh, you know, shoot down even more people, but they were able to contain him and people were able to uh, react accordingly because they go through these crisis management management drills on numerous occasions. So you practice, you practice, you practice, and I think that saved many people's lives because of that. Um, so we got to continue to keep uh, these drills, whether they're fire drills or emergency drills. We got to keep practicing these again and again and again. But uh, you know, this, as Jerry said, this was a um, a tragic event with young kids very young kids. I know it's not the first time it's happened. It's happened in other parts of the world, too. Uh, it just hits a little more home with us because it's, you know, about 90 miles north from here. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just uh, it's just unbelievable. And do you see this changing the way that drills work? I mean, it, it was only recently that I think New Jersey passed the act that every month we have to do a fire drill and some kind of an emergency drill, either a, a shooter drill or a bomb scare or something. Do you see more of this happening, or where, where do you see this going, Brad? Yeah, I think, I think you know, the kids understand what they need to do with a fire drill. I don't know if it's necessary to have as many fire drills in New Jersey. You have one fire drill a month. I don't think that's necessary. I think maybe 
uh, four or five times a year is fine, and then make that up with uh, more emergency drills. Right now, I think we have to do about eight or ten emergency drills, uh, whether they're lockdown or, or active shooter or um, evacuation. Um, I think uh, that needs to be reexamined. I mean, two day, three days ago, I was at a, a conference in Morris County for this exact thing. Uh, with uh, you know, uh, crisis management people, police officers, we were talking about this. And the guy told us, he's like, look, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And sure enough, two days later, in a place just very similar to where I work in Chester, this happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the notion that we're, it's not going to happen to us is crazy, because it is, it could it, it can happen anywhere, anytime. We have to be prepared. We have to take these things seriously, these drills and other things, and anything we can do to protect the students and staff in our schools. And how do we protect ourselves through, you know, 21st century technology? I know Brad was saying that he's got a plan that his school district's working on of how to communicate from outside to inside are we talking using the power of hashtags and Twitter? You know, can we do we have a special um, school district hashtag that only the the school district and the police follow? How, what are some of the things that are being done these days to really help keep us safe in our digital environment? I mean, there are apps and whatnot that will be able to connect, let's say, parents to uh, schools and teachers and staff members, and there are apps and, and methods that principals and administrators can use to notify in case of emergencies. And we, we're going to, everyone, in some form or another, has to be able to uh, use some way of these notification systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know um, that a, you know, one of the things the news did get right, you know, was that a, a, an instant alert was sent out, whether it's, you know, I know in, in our school we use Honeywell, um, it's an instant alert that goes out in mass to people's phones and emails. Uh, you know, so, you know, we do have that um, ability to communicate with people. Um, but sometimes you can't get to your phones, or your computers to do that. Um, uh, meaning a landline phone, um, though you could probably do it on your, your cell phone, your smartphone. So that's why we have to think outside the box. I know um, many schools are using Twitter and Facebook to communicate I've seen instances, I've read about instances where schools have done that in a time of crisis. They do tweet out brief messages to keep people informed because people are uh, able to get to that right away. Um, so it's just something that uh, we're definitely going to look at, something I'm going to promote. Uh, I'm right now just getting my staff in my new school onto Twitter. Um, but then that next step is definitely using the power of hashtags. You know, we have to really uh, upgrade our emergency contacts uh, before even school starts and to know the best way to contact each and every parent or guardian of the children. And, and I think just that instant communication is a tool that we really do need to get the community involved. And I know for my own school, I use Remind 101 to keep up to date with all of my kids whenever there's a concert I, I pop out you know what time they need to be there and, and stuff like that but even with that I have probably about 98% of my kids on the system I do have three or four high school teenagers that don't have cell phones so of course then the question is well then how do I get a hold of them do I send them emails do I send them um, uh, do I do I make personal phone calls to their house you know how how does a school district with 5,000 you know, 10,000 kids, how do you reach everybody well, immediately? Well, Jeff, that's, that's why you have to find out the best way to communicate with the parent or the guardian. That uh, may not be by a, uh, a mobile device. It may be some other form, maybe just by a telephone. But this is what you must determine right away. And the teachers must have emergency go kits too. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, you need to be able to communicate with people in multiple ways in this day and age. Uh, there's no way around it, and that's just the reality of it. You need to be able to communicate with them through social media, through landline phones, through cell phones, through whatever measures possible to for them to get the message. It should be five or six different ways. Exactly. And that's and it's very easy with technology now. You can do that. I know with our Honeywell Instant Alert system, when parents go in to update their information or set it up, they can say, "Hey, I want to get a message in my email." 
I want to get a text message. I want to get a phone call on my cell phone and a phone call at my house on my landline phone. So you can pick up to four or five different ways that people can then you layer on top of that Twitter and Facebook because the way we have it set up in our in our district, in my school, I'm the one that uh, curates the Twitter and Facebook accounts. Um, you're able to, whatever you tweet, it automatically posts on your Facebook page. So I've set that up as well. So I'm not going to two different things and posting it. It'll look the same on both. And is Honeywell, can, is Honeywell a free system or is that a subscribing thing for your school district? That's a, subscri- a subscription, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's a very uh, robust system that does its job. It's efficient and people, it's, it's very reliable. Jerry, how do people communicate, um, you know, uh, only a few years ago before cell phones were going? What was the, what was the mode of, of, of disseminating information? Telephone. Uh, either telephone at home. We had the phone number uh, uh, at home and at work for, for the parents or guardians. That was the main method of communication before technology. And, Brad, I, I would assume your school still has a phone chain that pops out. We don't use phone chains. Uh, we, we do pump one out, but it's not used. That's like for rare, rare instances. Um, I know with hurricane Sandy in my former district in Reddington, they tried to use the old, the good old phone chain, but with everybody's phone lines being off or torn down by trees, it, it was irrelevant. So what happened was the most reliable, uh, way to communicate during hurricane Sandy was social media. Um, it was amazing to see the uptick in people who, in my new district in Chester, who, um, who signed up for our Twitter and Facebook accounts. And they were very appreciative of the updates, um, that we put on Twitter and Facebook. Um, now some people, you know, you have your, your handful of people that were a little bit upset because they didn't know about it. But at that particular time, it was such a unique circumstance that that was really the only way we could communicate with people. So that's, that's, that's what it was. And I used uh, my library website to notify people about it, just information, not emergencies. But, but that was up, stay, updated regularly. And schools should have a website or some place where they, people know they can go to. You know, they don't have that mobile capability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jerry brings up a good point. You know, that, that the website, you want to you wanna leverage the power of social media to bring people back to your website. That's how you want to we- use as many methods as possible. And, and that's just one of the many ways that parents can find the information. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about social media and how it's being used in the greater educational community. I mean, um, it was only a few years ago that not a lot of educators were on Twitter. And people didn't know about social media. And now it seems like we're about 50 to 60 percent of educators now have some kind of social media presence or account. And every single night you can find some educational Twitter account going on Twitter, Twitter chats, as they call it, based off these various hashtags. Now, we've already said that hashtags were important because it collects um, a like-minded Twitter stream. Um, Jerry, talk a little bit about some of the chats that people can find and why the Twitter chat is being very useful these days in helping um, not only for professional development, but to get a group or social group's message across. Well, well, chats are just amazing uh, because it brings like-minded uh, educators together. Um, for example, tonight we have first chat. I mean, this is first grade teachers getting together, and this is going to be a, a really tough one tonight because of what happened in uh, Stony Creek. Tonight meeting on uh, Sundays. Right, Sunday night. Uh, there's 21st Ed Chat tonight, which is going to talk about... Uh, uh, motivating, uh, trying to motivate kids who, you know, are not really engaged in learning. I mean, that's such an important thing because you do have these children in your classes. Uh, SAT chat was amazing yesterday. It's an amazing chat, and, and not only for administrators, but for teachers as well. Uh, and Brad and uh, Scott are doing a fantastic job, and Bill are doing a fantastic job. I'm so happy we finally have a, a, an active venue where ed, administrators can get together aside from just the CP or, or connected principals chat hashtag. Um, there's chats for every grade level, every subject area. Tomorrow night you have ing, ing chat, English teachers get together and social studies teachers get together at the same time. 
Uh, it's just an amazing way for people uh, to meet once a week to chat, but that hashtag is 24-7. If they have any questions, any ideas for lessons, people will help them out and give them ideas. And that's the beauty of Twitter. We are a caring, sharing network of passionate global educators. Now, Brett, I've asked you this question before on our podcast. You're still relatively new to, to the whole social media aspect here and, and the social Twitter world. How has it changed your relationship with education and being able to connect with educators that you might not have ever known? Like, again, the Burgesses out in, West, in the West Coast. Yeah, and it's just changed my life, my professional life, in, in ways that people, some people just don't understand. I mean, it's been about just over a year now that I've been on Twitter and, you know, it's, you know, from, from doing, doing a podcast with Jerry is just a, it's a great, uh, it's an unbelievable experience for me. Um, meeting people and, uh, and working with people such as yourself, Jeff, you know, you look at Eric Scheninger, um, the Burgesses out in the West coast, um, if you were to tell me that I would be able to connect with uh, Dave Burgess, who is an outstanding social studies teacher, but also an author and a speaker um, who's known worldwide, um, and to be able to do a Google Hangout with him during a live sat chat at Ed Camp, New Jersey, is just, you know, if you would have told me that a year ago, I would have laughed at you. Um, having direct access to people like Todd Whitaker, hanging out and having direct access to people like Principal L out of... Uh, out of the uh, Thomas Edison uh, Charter School down in Delaware. I mean, I can just go on and on for hours, the impact that this has had. But SatChat has, has given people a voice. It's given people the ability to share. Uh, a teacher in the Chester School District in, at my middle school, Black River Middle School, made a, a very uh, interesting comment to me the other night at a staff party. She's like, you know, I can see why they brought you in, Brad. The, the, the way education is now, it's really changing. It's, it, it's very obvious that people are leveraging technology and social media so that people can share. People can share ideas. They can share resources. They can share lessons. And just whatever they can do to promote the success of students. So I can see why that they hired you to bring in to, to really shift our way of thinking. And not only can that sharing happen um, online, uh, on Twitter or what have you, but it can it, it, it transfers over to the school setting and people are collaborating. That's a very important skill that kids need to have now as well in the 21st century and that ability to collaborate. And f tools like Twitter and specific tools within Twitter, like a hashtag, allow for collaboration and teamwork. I think, what's, okay. what's really interesting, it's a level playing field. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I never realized in my life there I'm tweeting with the governor of a state. Uh, I'm tweeting with the head of the head of a, the, one of the largest teachers unions in the world. I'm t tweeting with average teachers, with principals, with superintendents. I'm connecting with them. I'm Skyping with them. Yeah, but we're sharing ideas. We're learning from one another. But Jerry, and you're I think saying it's I can't wonderful that we have the administrators on Twitter who are really there to learn, to listen, and share. Absolutely. And, you know, tomorrow night, Monday night, I'm going to a reception at the governor's mansion, Governor Christie's mansion. That would have never happened had I not met uh, Fort Lee Superintendent Steve Angravale on Twitter. And now I've been able to talk with him a couple times on the phone. I met him a couple times in person. But because of that connection on Twitter, and he's a New Jersey educator, I'm a New Jersey educator. He knows I'm passionate about kids. I was invited back in August to a roundtable uh, where we talked about educational issues in New Jersey with Governor Christie. And I guess, you know, at the end of the year, every year, he invites all the people that were invited to his mansion uh, over the past year to his, his mansion again for a, a holiday reception. And uh, so that'll be something that uh, I'll be enjoying tomorrow night as well. Well, that means you'll have to come back on the podcast, Brad, and talk to us all about it. <laughs> or I will. I will. We'll, we'll, we'll see if by the time the show comes up, Brad can get us some pictures for our show notes page. <laughs> you know, two weeks ago, we released a show featuring some of the great um, student leaders. You know, we did, we did the student voice show. 
And, you know, we talk a lot here, Jerry, about educators reaching out to educators, but we really haven't spent a lot of time talking about students and students finding a voice and teaching our students. What, and I'll, I'll throw this out to both of you, but what are some of the ways that we can really teach our students to create those digital footprints and start to learn how to reach out to each other? Should we be encouraging our students to follow their favorite colleges on Twitter to try to maybe leverage uh, admission, possibly? Well, we, well, first of all, we really have to spend a lot of time. We're not, I don't think we're doing enough on all grade levels with digital citizenship and digital footprints. They have to realize whatever they put out there stays out there. And, and I also, uh, I'm amazed. There's one chat that I am so thrilled about. It's Adam Taylor, uh, Two Foot Giraffe started. It's a science student chat that includes scientists, teachers, and students. And I don't, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but it's going to have the students start moderating the chat. And here we have students, high school students, collaborating and learning along with scientists, teachers, and other fellow students. I mean, now how great is that? That's that's amazing. So, you know, that's getting innovative. And, and yes. also, I don't know if you guys have heard about the Patui chat, which is P-A-T-U-E, oh, sure. which is, I believe, on Tuesday nights after Ed Chat. And basically what Sam is doing out there in Palo Alto is he's getting all of the Palo Alto um, businesses, the software developers, he's putting them in a big room to do video presentations. At the same time, they're live streaming it. And at the same time, they're doing a full Twitter hashtag chat. So he's really bringing this idea of Twitter chats and educational uh, you know, information, multimedia and multi-level. I mean, people are really starting to get pretty creative with these things. And Brad, you're doing it too with Sat Chat, right? You're you and Scott have been taking Sat Chat on the road and doing live presentations to places like um, Edscape and and EdCamp New Jersey. Yeah, we've been very fortunate to uh, you know have the help of TeacherCast and um, our other uh, right hand man uh, Billy Krakauer. Um, we've been able to do Eric Scheninger's Edscape conference. Uh, EdCamp New Jersey was an unbelievable experience. Um, we're coming up, we're doing live sessions at Educon 2.5. We're actually going to do a special uh, time at lunchtime at Educon 2.5. Um, and uh, another uh, very uh, breaking news, important announcement, we are going to be live at the NASSP conference, the National Association of Secondary School Principals. It's a big-time worldwide conference down in Washington, D.C. We will be doing the sat chat live from there at 7 30 a.m eastern standard time on march 2nd and it's just uh you know brad, again brad that you... is great news because we got to get these other administrators aware of what's going on in in the wonderful world of twitter for educators yeah we, uh, and we stick oh. up with them all hello hello jerry Jerry, you're fading on us. Uh-oh. I'm here, Jeff. <laughs> Brad, that's great news. I, I think we're paused here until Jerry comes back. But, dude, that is that is so great news. Yeah, so we're really looking forward to it. There's some, some great um, experiences there coming up. Uh, as Jerry said, we need to con continue to promote, promote, promote. And the idea of uh, social media, Twitter, and connecting and collaborating. And, and you know, you're in a middle school, right, Brad? Yes. So do you see your kids on Twitter? Do you see your, your teachers interacting with your students on, on Twitter? Do, they, do, your, do your classrooms have uh, Twitter feeds? Or I'll even start with, does your school have a hashtag? We're, we're getting there. Um, over the last few months since I've been there, we have I have done some Twitter PD expand your PLN workshops with the majority of staff, not only in my building, I'm also supervisor of instruction for the district. Uh, we are, are, are doing that over the next few months, getting people acclimated to the idea of using Twitter. And then as time goes on, we're going to create a hashtag for our school, for our district, where we can post uh, resources and have a place to collaborate and communicate. And then down the road, yeah, I want, I want to see our kids using Twitter for education. They're on it. Uh, a good portion of them are on it. 
And um, I know because uh, in my former school, I, I've had some kids follow me, and then they realize what I'm tweeting about, and then <laughs> very quickly they unfollow me, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is fun. But it gives you an idea, a sense that, hey, they're out there using it. So right. why not use it to help them out from an educational standpoint? Jerry, are you back with us? Jerry? Oh, not yet. Jerry's still out. Um, you know, just kind of flipping the switch here, you know, is, in your opinion, Brett, is Twitter the thing? Is, is Do you see something on the horizon that's going to be happening? I mean, we did have Google+. Plus. Do you Are you one of those guys that recommends that a school district needs a Facebook page and a Google page and a Twitter page? Or are you just looking for that one, maybe two ways of communication out there? Again, you know, you have a great website. Do you need a Facebook page? Yes, you need to, you need to be cutting edge. You need to be relevant. You need to be able to diversify the way you communicate with your stakeholders. Um, it's very easy now. It's not that hard to have a Facebook, to have a Twitter page, to have a Google Plus uh, page, to have a website. Um, you can manage all those things with a few web tools. And uh, you just got to have the right person in place and then just be able to communicate the information out. But you really want to have a main hub, which should be your website. Uh, at least that's my thought. You know, maybe some other people think differently. And then use those social media tools to bring people back to where the main information is. Because the website is a known entity. Mm -hmm. It is an expectation that people can come back to that. Um, so that's, that's what you try to do. Now, what about mobile applications? Yeah, that's another thing that, you know, it's, it's on my thing, you know, things to do list uh, is to also have an app, um, you know, that is very similar to our website, um, but it provides, again, communication information to stakeholders in a timely and relevant fashion. Now, a, a couple of days ago, I saw Eric Scheniger post the topic of what would you like to see educational trends happen in 2013 or you know, where would you like to see educational technology in the next year? And I popped a thing back to him and said, I would love to see educational school websites be responsive. And that's a term that we use in, in web page making, meaning it's one website that works both for desktop screens, iPad screens, iPhone screens. I don't see school districts, and maybe because it's the cost, but I just don't see school districts keeping up to date with their digital technology when it comes to putting stuff out like that. I mean, there's a lot of websites that are great for desktop, but they don't really work well on the devices that their community owns. Yeah, I don't see that either. Um, I just sent a blog post out recently where, you know, for me, for 2013, I would like to see a refocus from districts and from government officials to putting money and resources back into existing technology and also maintaining the technology that we have. Uh, we need to make sure that our infrastructure is able to provide Wi-Fi to anybody that enters these buildings. We need to make sure we have a robust technology staff that can make sure that technology is an excuse during a lesson or during an activity or something that's going on in school. Everything is always working. We need to make sure that we have tech coaches, not only in a district, but at each building to work with our teachers so that they know how to use Web 2.0 tools and technologies that we already have in place efficiently and effectively. We need to make sure that teachers have time. We need to give them time, more than what they have now, to work with these tools. And finally, we need to just leverage the power of, of social media. We need to leverage the power of technology that we have now to meet the needs of students. And we just got to continue, continue, continue to get people to buy into what we're doing, keep it simple, but at the same time move forward and be innovative. It's it's a tough. It's tough to balance that. But we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. We have a lot. We have an issue right now in many schools throughout the, the country, and that is we have all these devices sitting around, and some people don't know what to do with them because I think we're moving a little bit too fast in some regards, and so we need to make sure as I said before, that we have all our ducks in a row so that everything is efficient and effective. 
Now, when you say we're moving too fast, I, I, I want to dig into this one a little bit because who is the we? Is it we students, we teachers, we technology? Because as soon as you upgrade your entire infrastructure to 3G capabilities, then 4G comes out. And as soon as you say, all right, we're going to optimize our website for iPads, well, then the 9.7-inch iPad comes out. So how on a limited budget do we keep up with you know, the, the rapidly changing world? I mean, I know right now talking to like people like you and Scott and, and our district here, New Jersey is trying to figure out how to do online testing, but you have to have a certain size tablet screen, I think. Maybe you can help me out with this one. But the size tablet screen is not the iPad mini. It has to be the normal 10-inch iPad. How do we fundraise? How do, how do we do this, Brad? Yeah, I mean, we just need to, again, get it back down to the basics in some regards. Um, you know, you let your innovative people continue to be innovative. And to me, what, what simple and basic means now is that, all right, if you have Google Docs as your main form of communication and collaboration, then let's use it effectively. Let's use Gmail effectively. Let's use Google effectively, Gmail, Google Plus. Let's do that well. And, um, and if you can do that, it's going to help everybody out, all the stakeholders, each and every day. Um, yeah, you know, we want to do online testing. I think that's great. Um, but we're seeing that New Jersey's having some issues with that, with the park testing, with the park pilot. And I, it's, it's, it's an issue. I think it's a great idea. But I, I, obviously, I wouldn't want to have my grade or my test taken on an iPad versus somebody who can do it on a computer and do it in a third of the time. Yeah, so that's something that's still two or three years out and maybe even longer. But we'll get there. We'll get there, but we need to make sure we do it right. And uh, look, I mean, schools should always be assessing kids in many ways. And uh, regardless of the NJSC or the um, HS, uh, HSBTs or the, or the parks or what have you, um, you need to continue to just assess kids and, and use that data to improve instruction and, and make learning fun and engaging. Well, let us know what, uh, what the governor has to say about all that. Absolutely. <laughs> I guess we're uh, we're running out of time here, and Jerry, we we kind of been disconnecting here. I've been trying to get a hold of him. Um, I guess we're having some Skype issues down there. Brad, I want to say thank you for uh, coming on the show one more time. We always enjoy having you, and of course, congratulations on the success of Sat Chat Saturday morning, seven thirty Pacific and seven thirty Eastern time. Um, what kind of topics do you do you think you're going to be hitting coming into the new year? We have some very exciting plans uh, coming up. We're going to continue to be live and engaging at various conferences about the topics that matter most to people. Uh, we're going to continue to promote the idea of, of leadership uh, um, being uh, collaborative and, and learning through social media. We really want to promote the idea of supporting emerging school leaders because we have leaders everywhere um, throughout our schools. And we have some yes. great topics coming up, so we're looking very forward to that. Jerry, are you back on? Yeah, I got onto my iPad. <laughs> Welcome back. We've been uh, we're, we're kind of wrapping things up here. I was I was Brad was telling us about some of the great topics that are happening on Sat Chat. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of the, the topics that you might be featuring? Um, you know, I know you, you you work really well with the Ed Chat team, and you're also very very popular in the what do you do Fourth Chat and L Chat and New Teacher Chat. What are some of the great topics that you're seeing these days on, on these various educational chats? Uh, there's just a wide range of, of topics on all, on all areas educational. I think it's just uh, amazing, you know, the the collaboration that occurs as a result and the ideas that are transmitted. And there's a lot of things you don't think of yourself. I noticed this on an Ed chat where someone will say something totally different from what I ever thought of. And, and it's amazing how perceptive people are. Mm -hmm. Brad, let's, in closing, tell us a little bit about where we can find you on your various social media channels. You can find me at bcurry5 on Twitter. Uh, you can follow my blog um, at www.bcurry.wordpress.com and also through the TeacherCast family website. Um, and you can find me on SatChat every Saturday morning, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'm always around on various chats throughout the week. Uh, I love social studies chat on Monday nights. As Jerry said tonight, I like to uh, every once in a while participate in 21st century ed chat. Tuesdays, I love ed chat. 
Um, Wednesdays, I love PT chat and um, Ed Hire chat and Nebraska Ed chat. And, um, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. There's many great chats out there. Um, and we're just very excited, everybody, each and every day to collaborate. And uh, that's what it's all about. And can before leaving, Brad, can you address the rumors of Sat Chat working with petting zoos and uh, steel cage rings? Yes, that is that is not uh, happening anytime soon. Oh, um, not in Washington. Maybe, maybe we'll try to get the steel cage up and going, and, and maybe uh, Scott and I can wrestle around a little bit. <laughs> Jerry, where can we find you online, my friend? Uh, I'm a Twitter holic, so you can find me on Twitter at Cyberman One. Uh, the only reason it's one is someone beat me to Cyberman. <laughs> and of course, you can, <laughs> I do participate in a lot of chats. I want to see them maintaining and growing and and staying alive. And Tuesdays, you can find me moderating Ed Chat at noon and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Nice. Well, thank you guys again for coming on the show. And I mean, I know it's been a tough weekend for everybody with all the events that happened up in Connecticut. So thank you for taking the time and uh, thoughts and prayers go out to everybody up there in Connecticut uh, who's been affected by it. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff, for having us on. Oh, thank you, guys. Well, my friends, that wraps up podcast number 76. Uh, I want to thank everybody, uh, my guests again, Jerry Blumengarten and Brad Curry for coming on to the show and uh, certainly sharing their passions for education. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you'd like to do something amazing for us, please take a moment, visit us on iTunes, leave us a review, and give us a big five-star ratings. The higher the ratings and the higher the rankings that are we go, the more we're able to spread the TeacherCast message out to us. We have some amazing things happening in TeacherCast over the next few weeks. Check out our website, teachercast.net. Follow us on Twitter. Um, I, I can't really say much right now, but there's going to be some amazing, amazing things happening for TeacherCast. We're also looking forward to uh, several wonderful ed camps coming up in 2013. So good, good stuff happening for TeacherCast. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and you have been listening to the TeacherCast podcast. Please join us next time for another episode of the TeacherCast podcasting network. And uh, my goodness, hopefully next time I see you, I'll be a little bit better under the weather. And remember... Continue to share your passions with your students. Thank you, my friends. Have a good night.